has, has not met since the last meeting, but Ali, I think you're going to highlight some workforce issues by exception from the performance report. Yeah, no, thanks, Chair. Uh, so just a, a few things to add then, because I think quite a lot of ground has already been covered. So uh, the backdrop, obviously, is that as a trust, we currently have fairly low vacancy levels and we are uh, we are recruiting well, even given the economic climate. And a lot of those points have been covered earlier on in the meeting. Um, but our, our major issues really continue to be in the area of high sickness levels and annual leave. Uh, and, and Emma's described those really, really fully earlier on in the meeting. So uh, just to add a couple more bits to that, I think in terms of things that may not have been said earlier on. So in terms of sickness, uh, 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 workforce 18, uh, which is uh, slide 32 in the deck, I'm just making sure we read the right, right one. Um, you know, we are seeing continuing high levels of sickness, uh, which is sort of double our normal level that we'd expect at this time of year. Uh, and we also are seeing a higher proportion of mental health issues as well. So things like stress and anxiety and other common causes caused by sustained work pressure. So we know that and we're working on those issues and trying to support staff as best we can. And, and as Philip described earlier, that's sort of compounded by the absence due to COVID and COVID related reasons as well, which is that we still have around 100 staff. Who are, affected, who are affected by that. So um, we have developed a full, full and focused action plan to actually try to address the sickness levels, which will focus on both improving uh, sickness uh, absence, but also being supportive on the, at the same time. So, um, and I, I do expect actually, and, and Tom and I are talking about this in terms of, we expect this to be a continued focus for attention of the Workforce and Wellbeing Committee, I think certainly through the winter until it comes back to more traditional levels. <clears throat> so I'll say more about the, um, the sickness absence pathway and stuff at the uh, Workforce Committee in, in a couple of weeks' time for, for the more detailed piece of work there. But we're trying to apply a, a sort of a forensic approach to each stage of our, our sickness policy to make sure that it's actually managed correctly and in a supportive way as possible. Um, on the, the other uh, exception indicator is uh, on slide 29, which is the increase in disciplinary cases. So, um, so the first thing to comment is that uh, uh, the report has uh, produced, uh, I just looked at the number again this morning to, uh, to see what it was, and, it, and it's gone back down again in, in September. So I don't think we can read anything in the report as a trend line, I think. Um, so, but I do, what I would want to say, I think, is that it's not something that we want, we want or welcome. I think actually, but it is important for the trust, even in very difficult times, to ensure that it sets professional standards of behaviour. And and Beth and picked up quite right. I think some of the earlier sort of like uh, issues around uh, attitude and things, but also there are lots of explanatory reasons behind uh, sort of some of the things we're seeing as well. So, so I think we are trying to take as mature and uh, sort of like a, a reasoned approach to some of these issues as possible. But there are obviously some issues which are, are serious and do require uh, sort of more more firm management action, if I can put it that way. Um, one other thing to say, which again, we're, we're, we're covering much more detail. We have a specific item on the Workforce agenda, uh, Workforce Committee agenda on the 14th, 14th of October, is that we are uh, getting much better analytics in this area as well. So uh, John Porter, who's my deputy, um, has been working on um, producing reports and making sure that we have much better access and real time access to a lot more information in the whole employee relations field. So we, we'll be talking through some of that and, and, and sharing some of that with the committee, which I think will be helpful, I think, in terms of not only being uh, shining a spotlight as to what's going on, but also in terms of seeking assurance that some of the things that we should be doing, we are doing as well. So I think they're all the things that, all, all the other things I was going to say, David, have been covered um, earlier on in the meeting, so I won't go over those. Right, David, you're up. <clears throat> Probably, I, I think some bottom headlines there, Ali. So I think people might want to come back with some some questions on that. Uh, uh, comments, Beth. Did I see you want, want about to make a comment, or was I? No comment. Okay. Any questions from from colleagues? And how he is reported. I think Chris has got his hand up. Yeah, sorry. Yes, Chris, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much, Chair, and thank you very much, Ali. Uh, it's just a quick question because I know some organizations are beginning to sort of um, have action plans, particularly on um, hiring um, mental first aiders. Uh, do you think it's something that we should be thinking about to support, especially this particular time where staff are really experiencing mental health issues? 
Yeah, it's worth saying that um, we actually have quite a range of mental health support. Um, so not only in our existing service, but also uh, we have a number of specialists in our team who actually provide additional support as well. So um, uh, I think the kind of thing you're talking about is sort of like acute support, really in terms of like right on the spot, as it were. So after, after incident type uh, support, those kinds of things. And generally speaking, if somebody needs that kind of acute support, we try and, we try and access it. But um, uh, yeah, absolutely something that we'll, we'll be looking at. Thank you, Tom. Uh, yeah, just following on from that. So the mental health first aid training, uh, I know I've, I've discussed with our consultant nurse for mental health and with the uh, wellbeing lead. And, and th is, th is there a block in the system in a business case or something, Ali? Because I think there, there is external money available to provide mental health first aid training. Uh, and 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 uh, I'm not sure where we are with it. And maybe that's the detail might be for WWC, but Ali, just to Ali might not it. know the answer to, to yeah, this. Do you want me to jump in, Ali? Uh, yeah, so there's no block, yeah. um, Tom. It's going through um, a process, but Emma and I um, uh, have to work together on this. Our concern, of course, is abstraction at the current time um, and significant abstraction uh, you know for four days for everyone that undertakes the course because if we do it we want to do it properly so it's not that it, it's not going through the process it is and we're having those discussions so it, it's not at a stage where it could be approved yet I think that's fair to say isn't it Emma not for lack of support but just because we need to get it right sure yeah so I, I didn't mean lack of I didn't mean to imply lack of support in the um uh, when I use the word blockage, but I think, you know, I, I, I recognise, again, it's another one of these very finely balanced things, you know, we've got a, a workforce that's very stressed, as we know, uh, we've got, uh, uh, we can't release people for training, as we know, uh, 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 and it's just another example of, and I don't know the solution, and I know everybody's cited on this on the board, uh, of at some point, we're going to have to think about the the balance of that risk. That is notable. Also, note the note the response. So that's uh, it's important. Now it's under act active consideration. So thank you. Are there any other um, raised hands at all on this ticker item? So, so in terms of the workforce report, we can receive that uh, and um, move on to the the next item, which is uh, finance and the finance information committee. So David, David Hammond, good morning. Good afternoon, right? Uh, good afternoon. Afternoon, everybody. So uh, I'll keep this relatively brief. Um, so just to remind the board, we're on a, uh, a block contract as the whole of the NHS is at the moment. So uh, our income is prescribed by a mathematical formula from the centre for the year. Um, and we've agreed to a plan which, uh, when extrapolated for the whole of the year, gives us a £10 million deficit against that uh, amount of income that we're receiving. Uh, and that's been accepted by the centre and the system and is uh, fundamentally uh, out of our control in that sense. Um, as you'll see in, in Howard's report from the FIC, we went through this in some detail, uh, sorry, Finance and Investment Committee, uh, we went through this in some detail. Um, and I think the way that we are using money uh, is appropriate and certainly is being put into uh, frontline resources to uh, ensure that Emma and her team have as many um, as many staff as we can possibly get out there whether it be an EOC in 111 or on the road at the moment. Um, we're still waiting for, <clears throat> excuse me, we're still waiting for formal guidance uh, for half two of the year, which uh, the very astute of you will recognise starts tomorrow. Um, so we, we have a, uh, a, a direction uh, from the centre, and it's not just us, by the way, this is the entirety of the NHS provider and commissioning uh, functions. Uh, we have a direction and the centre are working very hard to get that document out to us and we know what we're doing. So there's no uh, sort of lack of funding or lack of cash flowing around. Um, but the formal planning guidance for the second half of the year has not been released yet, as we thought it would be. They did say end of September. So I guess they've got till about half past five today. Um, as such, I mean, we're continuing to to plan as we have been for the rest of the year. Um, and obviously, with as we've talked about a lot in this meeting, uh, now that we've got the performance cell up and running and David's here to take it to the next level, um, you, you know, our future planning and our planning going into certainly uh, quarter four and into the next financial year uh, will be based on the outputs of the performance cell, which can only put us in a stronger position um, th than we have been ever in the past. 
I think it's really important that, you know, our, our, the basis of our planning has to be to maximise uh, resources to aid the patient, um, of course, and but to acknowledge that the um, likelihood is the system will not have significant investment within uh, provider trusts and particularly the ambulance sector as they're looking to prioritise uh, elective surgeries and, and catch up on the impact of the pandemic. And therefore, it's really incumbent on us as an organisation, I think, to make sure that we're not being wasteful in any way. So whilst maximising um, staff resources so that we can put as many people into control and, and on the front road, uh, sorry, on the front line and on the road, uh, we also must make sure that we're not wasting money anywhere else. Um, in terms of uh, just, just one piece, which I know has been on the board agenda for a while, and there is a concern at the board, which I absolutely endorse as well. Um, we are still working through with our commissioners, our 111 funding for the year. So the board will recognise that we have a, uh, a gap between um, the demand that we are receiving in 111, as we've talked about in other parts of the meeting, uh, and the underlying financial settlement for 111. So we are working through that with commissioners. I will provide a more detailed update in uh, part two of the board in the private session. Obviously, as uh, everyone can appreciate, it's uh, commercially sensitive um, as 111 is let on that basis. So I, I won't provide any uh, numbers here, but uh, just to let the board know and the public know that we are uh, working with our commissioners on that and expect to have a resolution in the next couple of weeks. Uh, that was it from me. Thank you. Thank you, David. I think the board will, the board will take comfort from and thank you for your uh, you and your team's financial leadership in these difficult times where we're not quite sure what next week's book, what next next week's income is going to be, but we seem to have got plans to get through it. So uh, we we thank you for that in terms of the life in the modern NHS. So, so before I begin, Howard, for the Finance Committee report, any questions at all from of, of David regarding our financial position? We're hearing David, we have got cash to pay our bills and we pay our staff and we are meeting our, our targets. That's the important thing. We just wait for clarification of that. Our financial targets we're meeting. We we'll wait for further clarification of that for the rest of the year. Uh, absolutely, uh, David. And and uh, the key thing to remember is, whilst we can, uh, you know, manage to run a deficit for this year um, in line with the national expectation of us, uh, that will have a future impact on our cash and so forth. So we need to make sure that we are um, working uh, working with the system and that we are ahead of this in terms of our planning. Because what we don't want to create is a is a cash issue, um, particularly as we go into future years. So that, that's one of the key things that we'll look at as well. We're all looking. Well, important for the board to note that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we move on then. Howard, do you like to give the, the report from the Finance Information Committee, please? Yeah. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, David's covered quite a lot of it already. Um, but just to, it was interesting for me to see for the first time the uh, the ICS financial position. Uh, so it set out um, by trust who's in surplus and who's in deficit. And as we, we know, we've got 10, 10 million uh, deficit for the year, we expected. Uh, but that was matched by other trusts who were in surplus. So the overall position was balanced. Uh, but it was just interesting to see that analysis that uh, some are in surplus. Um, and uh, as David said, you know, we're sort of encouraged by the um, positive constructive conversations going forward because although you know we probably deal with it for this year it does have implications going forward that we we end up in a, a 10 million deficit that's not really uh, sustainable uh, going forward so we are we are concerned about that but um, uh, uh, you know discussions are ongoing on that um, the only other point um, I would raise that David didn't mention is the digital strategy. So we had a very good paper come forward on the digital strategy to the FIC. Um, very pleased and supportive of that. And I know Paul Brocklehurst um, is, is working very closely with the team on that as well. So it's first draft, but very good um, and very encouraging and, and very supportive. Um, that's it. Yeah. Thank you. That's a, that's a, that's a very, very good example of us being future focused as well, as well as dealing with the wiki present. We are actually keeping an eye on the future. So thank the executive team for that work, particularly the, those involved in our digital digital strategy. But I think you think what you said in your summary, Howard, and also from David Hammond's summary um, indicates the importance of our better by design work going forward and the work that trust needs to do as we plan for the next financial year and beyond about ensuring that our, our input or the, the demand on our service matches the 
matches than what we can supply and we and we, and we begin to deal with, deal with this deficit or we seek further funding if it's available but either way we've got to ensure that um, the whole the system is in balance so we can't continue to run and run the deficit um but that that deficit we currently carry is relatively small in nhs terms and is planned so uh, all it's done is put off some wiki decisions to be made decisions which are going to have to be made by us and our commissioners in the next six to 12 months so thank you david for um your leadership there and we will keep that very important work under the eye of the board can i move us on then to the next item which is the audit and risk committee michael uh yeah Jeff, thank you very much in the interest of um speed I, i've only got um three uh items that i want to refer to firstly we met last week on the 23rd of september it was a good meeting and thank you to all colleagues who participated also to governors observed and again my thanks to them um, there were three areas where using the standard terminology um, we were partially assured um, the first was a report that we received from internal audit on the freedom to speak up this raised uh, a number of in interesting issues important issues uh, the main message was that in terms of the number and um, of um, freedom to speak up uh, issues that were raised we are an outlier in comparison to other trusts we recognize that this is a really complex issue um, i do want to emphasize that we got a clear message and um, which i fundamentally 100 percent believe that um, executives are very much committed to freedom to speak up within the organization and act uh, appropriately but there is something here around possibly culture and and how people perceive what freedom to speak up is about and what it is appropriate to raise under that heading. Um, we have a, an agenda item shortly um, where we're going to discuss this more in detail, so I won't say any more. Um, but we were pleased with the response to the recommendations in the internal audit report. The only thing that I'd ask for is that a, a member of the executive team take overall responsibility for the implementation of the recommendations which I've been given assurance that will be the case. Um, the second area where we've got partial assurance, um, again, this is around uh, environmental sustainability. We are very clear that the Trust is doing a lot in this space to ensure that the way in which we utilise resources, the way that we plan, we are very much focused on uh, the environment and climate more generally. Um, we thought that that work could come together in a more clear coherent strategy and again i'm pleased to note that that is something that david hammond and colleagues will be taking forward and the final area where we received partial assurance was around business continuity um, again i would emphasize to the board we didn't regard this as um, something that was um, causing us you know terrible concern what we observed was that because of the pressures of covid and others on the trust some of the things that we were expected to have been done that had not been done but this is coming back to the board in november and i'm assured by the time we get to that position um be more than partially assured so those were the three items that um, i would bring to the board's attention thank you michael um any questions at all of of the audit committee. Thank you. We, we receive that report. Uh, Chair uh, Laurie's hands up. Sorry, Laurie, I missed you there. Sorry. No, it wasn't a question. It was m more of a comment, and that is that freedom to speak as she has been put to uh, onto the WWC agenda. And what we're looking for is to try and understand why we're so out of uh, kilter with other trusts more particularly to look at the nature of the freedom, freedom to speak up um, issues to see which ones are better handled through, would be better handled through a more general uh, management uh, management process and to ask how we can perhaps uh, make sure that those that are more appropriate to uh, uh, staff management relationships, how we can shift those into that track and out of the freedom to speak up track so it's something we're actively looking at thank you that's good to hear and we'll pick that up in that specific item in in, in a few moments thank you for that so can i move us on then to 
equally important um, report which we uh, as a board have to have to receive periodically. I think Fiona you're going to just introduce uh, item 3521 the learning from deaths report. Yes thank you chair. So um, members of the board will be familiar with the format but I'll just go through the highlights from this report. This is from quarter three of 2020-2021 and covers the months of October, November, December last year. Um, we saw an increase in the number of deaths uh, that the service attended over that quarter, which reflects both the fact that it was running into winter and it was the second wave of COVID and we saw the highest numbers in December. We undertake 20 structured judgmental reviews a month uh, from all areas of, of the trust and I'm pleased to report that the uh, findings are that we provided good or outstanding care in the majority of these cases. Each review uh, covers four areas of care, and I just wanted to highlight two of those. Firstly, the initial care provided, which reflects the speed of response. And we had a, a, a trend of increasing delays as we went through December. And I think that, uh, that reflects the increasing demand on the service during the second wave of COVID. In terms of uh, treatment on scene, there were two cases which were flagged. One was a 71-year-old male in cardiac arrest where there was some delay in seeking advice from a senior clinician, but that wasn't felt to impact on the patient's survival. And a 96-year-old lady who arrested while the crew were with her, and despite having a do not attempt resuscitation order, the crew uh, went on and did partial resuscitation, the reasons for which were unclear. In terms of avoidability, 55 of the 60 cases reviewed were unavoidable deaths. And of the five, uh, three were uh, less than 50% likely to survive and two had only a slight possibility of survival. The uh, Learning from Deaths team also reviewed a uh, case brought forward from the Serious Incident team, and that was a 41-year-old male who had fallen down a flight of stairs. He had been drinking and when he was seen by the crew, uh, they recorded that he appeared to have capacity and refused conveyance. Uh, he was subsequently seen again on a further call and taken to hospital and found to have a significant subdural hematoma. So we were questioning whether the initial crew were correct in their assessment of his uh, capacity and felt that they, there was probably some learning there. So overall, for all the cases that we looked at, Chair, we saw good, outstanding and generally very compassionate care. Of the lessons learned, those have been addressed with the individual crews concerned. Thank you. Happy to take any questions. Thank you very clear. And, and, and very um we take in, take significant comfort from what, what you're saying in terms of the quality of service we're offering to our patients. Are there any questions of the medical director with that report? But, but in summary, Fiona, you're not highlighting to us any specific concerns regarding our current clinical practice that's leading to adverse outcomes. No, I mean, it's it's always quite difficult doing these these structured judgmental reviews because it is very much a, a judgment that you make on the quality of care. And sometimes they're quite tough to read through. And there was one particular case where um, an individual in his early 50s had had what he thought was indigestion, possibly chest pain, um, possibly some breathing difficulties. And because it was coming into the second wave of COVID, he decided not to seek care. And when we attended him, he was in uh, cardiac arrest and could not be resuscitated. And almost certainly, had he presented to medical services before that, I think there's a possibility he might have survived. Yeah. Thank you. Tom? Thanks, Fiona. A, a, a very good report. Um, two, two questions for me. One is about, so so you, you, you said that the, uh, the, the, the specific learnings will be addressed with specific staff members involved. Are there sort of more global, if you like, lessons that, that might be appropriate uh, trust-wide? Uh, you know, I'm just wondering about how, because we do learn from all of these, that, you know, it's in the title, isn't it? And is there, is, is, is there any sort of way that we can get key messages uh, uh, across all our um, patient-facing staff uh, from, 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 from these lessons without you know without breaching confidentiality and all the rest of it indeed so i think there are two specific areas that i'd like to highlight there firstly the decision making around uh, not 
commencing resuscitation and the and documenting exactly why those decisions were made. Uh, and then there's the overall standard of documentation, which I think is generally better with the EPCR, but often the free text could be um, more fully completed. Right, thank you. Uh, and the second question is around people with learning disabilities. And I think, I, 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 are we anywhere near a resolution of that? Because I think the system wasn't fit for ambulance uh, learning from deaths. No, because it's often difficult. Uh, we don't often, uh, firstly, in all the ones that we've done so far, I think we've only come across one patient who was known to have learning difficulties. It is highlighted in the template. So if the evidence is there on the EPCR, then we will pick that up. But so far, I think we've only seen one patient. With, and we've now been doing these structured judgmental reviews for over a year. Right, thank you. Thank you. So in summary, I think we, we thank you Fiona, we take assurance from the reports, but I think what your what the report indicates is the complexity of the work that our clinical facing staff have to undertake and they do have to make risk judgments. And we do acknowledge as a board that that judgment they make and we stand together with them in, in doing so. Your, your uh, report indicates there's no particular concerns other than we must continue to edu educate our staff and to ensure that the feedback is, is is widely widely shared so we do so receive it with we are assured by the process um, and I hope the public can take some comfort from the fact that we do look into su such detail even at times of stress the, the, the quality of work the, the quality of our clinical work so uh, thank you for that report. Can I move us on then to the say, say important item, which is the Freedom to Speak Up um, annual, uh, Freedom to Speak Up Guardian by annual report, item 3621. And um, I, I, hopefully Kim is online. I think Bethany, you're going to in introduce the item. And then uh, Kim Lake Ben, who's our guardian, is going to join the conversation. So uh, hopefully Kim is, is with us. She's online, yeah. Thank you, yeah, Tim. Tim, apologies for keeping you waiting. I know you've got lots to do, but uh, we've had other important business to transact as well. So, uh, Bethan, okay. over to you. Yeah, thank you. So, I'm really thrilled Kim's uh, joined us today. Um, this is her uh, six monthly report. Um, she's provided, obviously, a, a written comprehensive report, which gives you a, a sort of flavour of an incredibly busy. Uh, six months, but I won't take up any more time. I'll, Kim, I'll hand over to you to go uh, to highlight any exceptions. And I know you have um, a specific request as well from the National Guardian's Office you want to talk to the board about. I do. Thank you very much. So thank you, Chair, and good afternoon, everybody. Okay, good afternoon. Um, I'm hoping that hi, I'm hoping that you've all had a chance to. Um, so to asking you to pay um, attention to the following points and hopefully um, in these points I can raise some of the questions um, that I think Michael and Laurie spoke about um, earlier on. Um, but I'll start with one of the most important items that I'd like to raise to you today and that's in reference to the suggestion that some staff have experienced detriment following the raising of a concern or certainly a feeling that they haven't done the right thing in seeking up. Um, and I think that this could partly uh, be because we need to get better in ensuring lessons are learned um, and that they're actioned following a concern being raised. This I'm hopeful will be helped along by the management actions that have been agreed uh, following on from the most recent RSM audit. Um, so as it happens, I happen to have prepared, a, uh, um, taken a short paragraph from the National Guardian's Office public website. And I think that this will help to start to address um, the questions raised earlier. So if I may, I'm just going to read this short paragraph to you um, and it's under the title, uh, under the section titled um, What Can I Speak Up About? And it states that you can speak up about anything that gets in the way of patient care or that affects your working life. That could be something which doesn't feel right, for example, a way of working or a process which isn't being followed or behaviours of others which you feel is having an impact on the well-being of you, the people you work with or patients and speaking up is about all of these things. So um, I think that guardians nationwide offer the gift of an opportunity to learn. And in many cases, these opportunities are presented at a relatively early stage of someone's concern. But we must get better at taking these opportunities and making improvements before things escalate, which they, they often do. 
Um, and I believe that creating a clear route to ensuring the follow, follow up from raising concerns will eventually have a positive effect on where we lie within the FTSE index, um, but also with addressing how many things eventually come through the freedom to speak up route. So I believe that there are also some discussions taking part um, uh, within, within the NGO and um, relating to a piece of work linked to this. And I'd really like CCAM to be ahead of the curve um, because they have noted that all, CCAM, all ambulance trusts haven't been performing well in relation to the index. Um, so lastly, October is National Speak Up Month. Um, this year, the National Guardian's Office is encouraging everyone to play their part to speak up, listen up and follow up. Um, they are encouraging everyone also, no matter where you work in the organisation, to make a speak up pledge and submit this through a link on the National Guardian's um, Office website. And in addition, I'd like to be able to make um, to share these pledges over the course of October via my Twitter platform and through the official CCAM social media pages, which Adam has um, come up with some great idea for the graphics, so it, sh it should look really great. So what better way to get the ball rolling than to ask all of you here to write a pledge and submit it to the National Guardian's office and also to share it with our comms team. And once you've shown your commitment, then we can encourage others to join in. And my overall goal is to have CCAM as an organisation that submitted the most pledges. So um, a big ask for you. And that's all from me. Are there any other questions? Thank you. I think as a, as a, as a board, I'd like to think that we will support that, that, that initiative and, and, and individually and collectively. I think it's, it's the heart of, I know from the non-executive team, we're, we, we are actually determined to work with the executives to challenge inappropriate behaviour in the organisation, be it leadership behaviour or be it between, between staff groups or staff themselves. Um, and, and we need to be very clear what is acceptable and what is not. So uh, I think we will, uh, I'm sure, give every support to that, uh, to that process, Kim. Anyway, we must get into some questions about, let's say it's an important, very important report, um, which we take every six months. So I think, Chris, you were first, then Ali, what may wish to comment. Chris? Uh, thank you very much, uh, and thank you very much, Kim. Uh, really excellent, passionate report, and uh, thank you for that. Uh, just a quick question. I mean, if you look at some of the cases or issues that are being raised with you, which one do, would you say really gives you sleepless nights and what do you think we can do to support you? That's such a good question um, and quite a tricky one to answer without sort of breaking any um, confidentiality. But I would say that overall, um, there are two things I suppose I could note in answer to that. The first of which I've um, pointed out in the report, which is around sort of workplace behaviours and linking that onto some sexual harassment um, and that's certainly very difficult to hear um, and also um, there are you know there are frustrations in how we move forward with that that being said I am um, really assured that the new campaign that we've got up and running has got some I say we um, I think it's led by HR, but that's got some really um, great items and um, focus. And I think they're, they're focusing on six points to move ahead with, which all sound really great. And also the managing allegation um, teams within safeguarding um, are um, really focused on ensuring that there's the correct learning and, and, and you know, um, important things are discussed with regards to that. Um, and the second thing that concerns me the most, and I think overall the thing that concerns me the most is how we go about creating and establishing the lessons learned at CCAM. And I think that that's our really big key next step for um, making freedom to speak up have the impact and actually just get, um, ensuring that overall um, it's easier for staff to raise concerns. And I truly believe that once we have a really clear route for that, um, and in establishing those links, it will in turn have um, a positive effect for those concerns raised through Freedom Speak Up. In other words, I think there'll be a reduction because people will see that those lessons are being learned and, and implemented through local um, leadership teams. Thank you, Subo. Can, can I bring in Ali on this particular point? Th thank you, uh, Kim. Uh, can I bring in Ali on this particular point? Subo, I, 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 apologies, I missed your hand raised first time round. If Ali could do with this point, I'd then come back to your, your point. So, Ali? 
Yeah, I think um, so. Firstly, to say a uh, really good report and really welcome it. And you know, uh, Kim's highlighted I think a couple of things that you know ca cause us concern. I think and we're equally concerned about them, particularly where um, individuals feel they've suffered detriment as a result of raising something. That's not something we want, and it's not something that the trust wants overall. So, creating that safe and comfortable environment where people can come to work and do their job and not be. Uh, worried about anything in that sense and then they can focus on their work I think is, is where we want to get to. Um, having said that I, I do think it's going to require quite a lot, quite a lot of work because uh, this area hasn't had enough attention in the past and so uh, uh, issues like the, the campaign uh, which are leading the development of around um, uh, sexual misconduct at work and other, other areas as well are going to be critical I think to actually sending a really clear message to our staff that we're there with them actually in terms of 98 99 percent of staff we're absolutely here doing a great job behaving perfectly and all the rest of it that, that that's the kind of message we need to be sending uh, and that you know we will not put up with those kinds of things as a trust so um so i think it's going to be uh, it's going to be quite a part i think actually i think i am really appreciative i think just one pretty fine comment on the fact that actually there's a lot of support for this message and certainly with the unions as well locally they are very supportive of what we're trying to do i think actually and, and we'll stand alongside us with that message as well i think i think if i just on the from the board i think we would be uniting our support for appropriate leadership action when we are confronted with appropriate behaviour for speedy and appropriate action to be taken against anybody who behaves inappropriately. Assuming they've gone through an appropriate process and been assessed, etc. But um, as a board, you know, we do, we, will not, we do not wish to tolerate this in CCAM, period. Uh, and our active encouragement from the board to the executive to root out any potential inappropriate behaviour. Um, Subo, as I'll not lead for, um, not, not exactly lead for um, freedom to speak on matters, do you wish to comment? I do, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you, Kim and Bethan, um, for that introduction. And again, a really good report. It's just to say that Kim and I um, speak regularly um, and she updates me on all of these issues. Um, and it's important to say that um, we are doing some work on implementing a restorative and just culture. And I think um, HR and Ali are leading on that and there's some really good uh, work there. Um, I think it is fair to say that we don't have full assurance on this area. So I agree with Michael on this. And I think we have some work to do in the organisation in terms of learning from these incidents. And I don't think we've uh, captured all that learning yet. Um, and it's something that Laurie alluded to earlier, and that is we need to perhaps have some more oversight of this, and which is why we want to see more of this at WWC uh, and perhaps at QPS going forward um, so that we can really look um, uh, in a bit more detail and have full assurance uh, that these things are being um, sorted out in the way that we would like them to. Um, as far as some of the sexualized behaviour or inappropriate behaviour is concerned, um, uh, Ali and I have had a conversation as well about the Until It Stops campaign, uh, the six steps which is adapted from the EHRC, um, which looks really good going forward um, and I think also picks up um, some actions perhaps from previous report from Duncan Lewis about bullying and harassment. So I think it's really good that we are uh, going to act on this. I'm looking forward to the implementation plan um, when that comes through as well. And I think in terms of, uh, and Annie talked about this earlier, the numbers of disciplinaries, grievances uh, and also therefore suspensions, uh, I'm, I'm assured on this that uh, we are taking appropriate action and where it is warranted we are suspending those individuals pending an investigation as well. Um, so uh, those are the bits I just wanted to add. Thank you very Thank you. And thank you for your work in this area, Suvo. It's much appreciated. Um, Michael, do you wish to make a further comment? Uh, yes, if I, if I may, Chair. Um, I, I'm really assured by what Suvo says and what Ali is doing, but I, I would make this point. Um, I think it's important that we don't just look at the symptoms, that we have a much more integrated response to this. So. I'm only drawing on my previous executive career. Um, it is important that everybody in CCAM understands the values that we as a board and everybody else support. Um, I think Lucy, before she went, mentioned the fact that we had values uh, were very prominent. I don't think they're as prominent now as they should be. I'm also used to a system whereby every individual in, in any organisation has their annual or biannual appraisal. You talk with them about how do they subscribe to the values. They demonstrate what they are doing. So what I'm just saying is 
I, I genuinely, I think everybody's saying this as well, but I think we need to be focusing on the issue upstream, not downstream. So Kim's report is good. I, I accept that. But she's dealing with the consequences and dealing with the consequences is too late. It needs to be much more upfront. And I do actually think there needs to be a culture change in CCAM. I think the people are brilliant and great at what they deliver. But I, I do think we need to look at this because the culture is not right at the moment from what I'm seeing here. So I, I'm not really, I'm really assured by what Ali and Sibu are doing, but that's what I would like to see coming forward in, in the future. Thank you, Michael, as a board, I think we, we I think we'd all support that and we must make sure there's focus work in this area. Can I take some final questions? I think uh, um, David, David, please, I think your hand is up and I'll bring in Tom Quinn. Thank, <clears throat> thank you, Chair, and thank you Kim, for your report and uh, good to see you again. Um, uh, but my question was was simple is I've just joined this organization as a, as a new executive director. I've just joined this board. What actions I should be taking? Uh, would you recommend I take over the next three months as part of my 100 day plan to help improve the previous speak agenda and the culture? Oh, great. Yeah, thank you. And welcome, David, as well. Thank so, you. um, yeah, another really good question. Uh, I think um, also, I, I do think that we probably need to speak separately so I can give you a wider understanding of freedom to speak up and spend a bit more time on ensuring that, um, you know, you understand the whole process um, within the, the NHS for freedom to speak up and, and why it was established. But also, I think it's really important that you encourage um, your managers and leaders within your teams to um, to find the learning for when concerns are raised, to thank people for raising the concerns. And if they have any questions about perhaps what good looks like with, with relation to that, then um, I'm not just here for people to raise concerns too, but I'm also here to offer advice to managers and leaders in um, you know, how we can establish that learning and, and, and what good looks like in that respect. So um, if there are any questions, then please do encourage them to come and speak to me. Um, because uh, I think that's really important as well. At the moment, the message out is very much encouraging people to speak up, but we really need to get better at encouraging managers how to listen up and and to, to get that learning locally. Thank you. Um, yeah, good Thank question and good answer. Thank you. Tom. Thanks, David. And thanks, Kim. This is a really good report. Uh, uh, you mentioned about you know the, uh, the origins of Freedom to Speak Up, obviously the Francis report. Yes. And about patient safety primarily obviously it has developed since then what's striking in in your report here is is that, that no concerns have appeared about not feeling able to uh, to if you're worried about patient care patient safety about speaking up about that but uh, but in terms of assurance you know is, is it are we assured that g given the culture that that seems to be described in 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 your report that if people if our people have real concerns about patient safety that are not being uh, uh, addressed through the usual channels, if you like, uh, that they that they are appearing on your radar through this process? Yeah, so um, I, I have had some recent um, patient safety concerns or those, I suppose, that because, you know, I, the first thing I should mention is that from in the eyes of the NGO that all roads lead to patient safety so that that's the first thing to say but in in a very more clear um, respect of what patient safety is but I come back to the point I made around creating the learning and establishing that learning at an early point so um, it, it was actually um, um, sort of investigated a little bit more, not investigated, but the RSM actually looked at a, a particular uh, case that was very much related to patient safety and where we missed an opportunity for learning locally. That sub subsequently actually just been reopened um, and that now links on to the detriment that we're talking about and I'm raising here. So we've we've now, and that's where I, that's why these points have been raised. So there are patient safety issues um, that are raised through Freedom to Speak Up. I will admit that it's not anywhere near as many as perhaps things that would normally go through ER. Um, however, there are patient safety issues, but we're missing that opportunity for them to be dealt with at an early stage. And they're subsequently ending up um, through, you know, informal routes, which is this, this is now going into a grievance route. So um, that, that's where we need to get better. 
But, but if I may just say, Kim, we've no, what we've we've no evidence though of any major of any major concerns regarding care of patients emerging through your no. process. That's an important thing we need to know to support and recognise the lots we need to do to tackle. But essentially, we're not hearing no. issues regarding uh, putting patients at risk. No, absolutely not. And that and you know that's actually really reassuring. So one thing I think we do really um, generally um, over the organisation we do really well is. Um, that's sort of local learning from patient safety incidents. And I do think that, you know, many people talk about being able to raise things operationally and establish that learning quite quickly. Um, and there are routes um, for how that's managed. And so therefore not many things in that respect come through Freedom to Speak Up. It's in areas that, you know, there, there are still one or two places that um, perhaps that, that hasn't been the case, but there's certainly no overall concerns for um, sort of, things directly related to patient safety in that in that respect. Thank you. Well if there's no more questions, can I can I say first of all thank Kim, thank you for your ongoing work and leadership in this area. Thank you for the report. Uh, and hope and, and also thank Subo for, for working with you and support you and, and hopefully you get the message that the board do take this these matters extremely seriously. I think there's some highlights come out of your report though in terms of there is still work to do in CCAM regarding our overall environment, our culture, and the way we do things around here, particularly in terms of leadership behaviour, but also in terms of our staff understanding what leaders do and what their, their responsibility is as members of staff to raise things in the right way. So we, we must actively encourage that. The issues around leadership development, which I know Ali is, is leading on with the rest of the executive team in terms of empowering our managers to lead in the appropriate way, um, which will hopefully avoid some of the issues that then get brought to your, <coughs> your attention. And, and I would want us to revisit the point that Michael raised regarding values, the trust values. We do have them, they, they're widely publicised, but have we evidence that we all know them, that we all behave to that? They're very basic, they're very basic, and to answer David's point from the start, early on, the very key question, we should all be living those values. We don't want to live the values. My message is go and work somewhere else because that's what we believe in. That's what we're here to do. We're here to save our patients. And doing that, if we, if we live those values, we'll support each other and we'll give great care to patients. But there does need to be a clear message of the stuff coming out for what you're saying, Kim, that we will not accept going forward. And Ali's given evidence that we are tackling this. We will not accept unacceptable behaviour. We'll listen to people. We'll give every opportunity. To be to have this case, but we will not we will not tolerate any further inappropriate behaviour, sexualised behaviour, in, in, inappropriate use of power. Um, is not is not what we're about, and we wish to eradicate it from CCAM. So I think uh, thank you for your reports, and uh, look forward to further reports in six months' time. But further ongoing contact in the meantime. So thank you. We can move on now to two very important. I know we are behind time, but we've got two very important reports now, which uh, the board just need to receive and, and, and comment on appropriately. So, Ali, you're going to lead in the diversity and inclusion report and um, workforce um, equality standards report as well. Yeah, well, thank you, Chair. Um, so, I'll try and keep my comments to the point, I think, in terms of drawing out the key themes on both reports, if that's the okay. case. So, I'm conscious of it in the interest of time as well, but they are they are critical reports for us as a trust. So I think it's important uh, to just go go through the points properly. So I just wanted to start by sort of like offering special thanks to Asmina Chowdhury, who our EDI lead, who has the heavy burden of preparing these reports, and they're not they're not light reports. And I may, I may be adding to a workload a little bit more by asking for summaries as well. I think for for next time. So. That, um, actually, they're a little bit easier to get through as well because there's a large amount of uh, volume here. Uh, and, and, and I appreciate that not everybody has a chance to read through the whole report, and certainly in terms of like people who may be watching this this meeting. Um, so I think the first thing to say is, is that we do have uh, a duty under the law to set out uh, our um, uh, equality data annually. And uh, the report, the first report, the Diversity and uh, Inclusion Annual Report, covers the last financial year and makes sure that we comply with those duties. So, so this is this is the boring kind of legal bit. So just to get, get that bit out of the way. 
Um, we have as a trust, uh, just a reminder for uh, staff and, and public who may be watching as well, that we have a general duty to make sure that we eliminate uh, discrimination, harassment and victimisation. Some of the things that we've been talking about in the last item, I think our themes coming through that uh, and ones that this report picks up as well. Um, so it's really important that actually we're able to report in this way and actually make sure that we collect and analyse our quality information properly, both for staff, volunteers and, and um, patients. Uh, and that's the way we understand really how we're getting on in, in this area. So uh, a couple of things I wanted to flag uh, in more detail in the report itself. Uh, so the first one is uh, to uh, flag the work undertaken by our staff networks. Last year has been a pretty difficult time, I think, actually, in terms of the financial year. And um, uh, to pick up one example, actually, you know, it's sort of, it, was, it was a sort of, um, I think every, everybody sort of like trying to help each other in their own way. But, you know, I do want to commend the work that the staff networks picked up. And certainly when we were doing risk assessments for BAME staff, you know, they really stepped up to the plate, I think, actually to kind of really help out and be supportive with that. In fact, so much so that actually we were ahead of the game, actually, compared to other trusts in terms of some of our support to individual members of staff at that point. So I do want to sort of particularly commend that. And I know it's difficult because obviously when people are doing these roles in addition to their day jobs, uh, you know, they've got to go that extra mile, I think, to actually um, uh, to support others. So but I, I do what I did want to call that out. Um, the other couple of bits I wanted to pick up, uh, one was uh, despite the fact, I think when we come to the, the second report, I, I do think we've slipped back a little bit in some of those areas. But uh, notwithstanding that, we've also made good progress on, on, on a couple of things. So in this report, we flagged the fact that you know, we're one of the first trusts to get the gold award from the Employers Network for Equality and Inclusion, which is quite a rare thing. And only 13% uh, of NHS organisations actually get it. And at the same time, despite uh, coping with everything else the trust has been coping with, uh, we've also launched a gender equality network as well, so which uh, Emma is the interim chair of. So, um, so I think you know we have managed to do some some positive work as well. I think in, in the midst of everything else that people are uh, dealing with. One final thing, just to flag in this report, um, is that um, uh, Sue referred to the work that we've been doing around introducing the philosophy of a just and restorative culture. And I do think this is going to be one of the themes in, in the coming years that's going to be fundamental to changing the way the culture works within CCAM. So, and, and one bit that we've picked up in, in the report is the uh, uh, review of the disciplinary processes. So that what we're trying to do is, is get to the core point, which is how do we improve things, uh, rather than just take a punitive approach, which um, happens if you don't have that those values and culture underpinning what you're doing. So. Um, so I did want to sort of commend um, the people who've been working on that team uh, on that on that work as well. So because that that's not easy work, and it's sometimes work that goes behind the scenes, uh, but it, it's difficult technically, and it's difficult um, in terms of like uh, uh, implementing it as well. So but it, it is important, I think, for to bring the culture about change about that we want in Seacam. So, Joe, I might stop on that if that's okay. Yeah. Thank you. So that's the diversity and inclusion. Report, yeah. so we just summarise. So, so colleagues, questions of, of, or comments, um, please. Subo. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Ali, for that and uh, highlights in the report. This is a tour de force from Asmina, isn't it? My goodness me, how long was she working on this? Um, so it's great, lots of detail um, and lots of information in there. So uh, my thanks to her as well for presenting it. Um, just a few things. Um, the number of uh, BAME staff uh, in uh, roles is about up 0.7% from last year, I think. Um, number of BAME staff doing uh, clinical education is about 2%. Um, more BAME staff more likely to leave. Um, 3.13 number of cases um, in disciplinaries where there is no case to answer for the BAME, it's about 45%, so nearly half of them there's no case to answer, um, compared to about 18% for white colleagues. So it's not painting a very pretty picture um, of CCAM, and given what we just discussed uh, previously around uh, freedom to speak up, our values, our culture, um, it just seems to highlight that we, we, we do have a real problem uh, here. So. Uh, not that I'm looking to to answer this, Ali, uh, right this minute, but um, in terms of some other things, um, 
What about and have we thought about, I'm sure you have, but is it realistic for us to set hard targets uh, now uh, in terms of um, numbers of BAME staff that we have simply at every level of this organisation, um, what roles they do, what training they have access to, how we support them. There's, it's it's not training I'm, I'm asking about, I'm asking about hard targets and I would, I would look at you and Philip um, in terms of uh, are we going to set these and um, how are we going to make sure that they happen? Yeah, I think I might kick off and then I know, I know Philip's been involved in the work we've been doing as well on this, so he may want to add to this. Um, only a couple of weeks ago, we've committed as an executive team to input, to actually setting hard dumps in this area. In fact, so both on um, on the three major protected characteristics, we've actually set out our approach on each of those three. So uh, I'll, I'll focus on the two, that, um, on, on the one in particular, but also there's one other one I wanted to mention. So uh, it will save me covering in, in the second report, I was going to say. So in terms of uh, in, uh, our current position with uh, uh, representation of BME staff to all levels of the organisation is that we're currently at about 5.6%. Nationally, the NHS People Plan has set out a target to say that the NHS needs to move to a position of 19% representation in all grades across across the uh, across the NHS. Our local population is currently 14.8% BAME, and the the numbers we've agreed as an executive team that we want to move to over the next five years is to get to that level, so, um, so that by year four, by the end of year four we'll get to 11.2%, which will double our current representation, um, and uh, the year after that we should get to 14%. And, and I think that, that, you know, we've done quite a lot of modelling underneath this, so uh, in the interest of time today I won't do that today, but I do think it's important. The, for um, people to understand, you know, why we've set it in that way is because uh, because of the pipeline into the organisation. So that our staff take in in a number of jobs take quite a long time to train. So and and the higher education pipeline is important as part of that as well. So we're actually you know uh, you know part of it is within our own control and part of it is working with other organisations to actually affect the entry pipeline of this. So, Philip, I don't know if you wanted to add to that, but um, I know there's had a long discussion at the inclusion working group as well. Yeah, so it would have been great to, to have set a, a more ambitious target. But um, when you look at the, the numbers and the, the pace of rotation um, to get up to um, something like 19 percent, over half of our recruits would have had to been from the Bain community. Um, which is just not not, not achievable. Um, so that it's um, uh, that that's the thing that's held us back. I think that the the targets that we have set um, are um, are really really hard to to, to achieve, um, and um, we're going to have to do something um, that we haven't tried before um, to, in order to achieve them. So you know that's uh, I think it's ambitious enough. Um, I don't worry about. Um, about that, but um, yeah, I, I agree. Lots, lots to go for, and the um, the discipline one was really disappointing because we'd been heading in in the other direction for years, uh, for, for for a while, and um, I'd, I was hoping that that would continue, um, but there's there's been a, a change in this year, um, um, and I don't understand that, and, not, and none of us do, but we're we're looking at it. I think, Philip, though, just in terms of that, just listening to that, I think the boards would wish to encourage so that, to be ambitious with these targets. And even if we set a target, we can also have a stretch target, of one which we're going to aspire to at a later date. But so I think the, the I think we 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 need to be impatient in this to make sure we make we make progress because uh, the other sector has been behind the rest of the NHS. I accept the geography. Um, it's, a, it's a different challenge in the southeast. Nevertheless, the challenge is there. So we've uh, we do need to be to make sure we do have that target, but maybe have a stretch target as well to say we will be unashamedly ambitious in this area. Um, Chris, I think you were next. Then Michael. Then Tom. Uh, thank you very much, uh, and thank you very much, Ali, and uh, and also just thank Asmina for the work that she has done. I think it's a fantastic report. Um, just like what Suba just said, I have got slight concerns, particularly when we look at risk indicator three, and when we also look at the uh, in terms of recruitment, because I think the data has not really changed. It has actually got worse in terms of shortlisting to appointments. And I think it will be really good to sort of see what sort of measures you have now put in place in order to address that 
given the fact that we have got a huge number of BME people living in the organization, the question is, if we have got that kind of data, I think it's not going to be very attractive for people to come to the organization. Now, if you couple that with the disciplinary, where we have got 45% with no cases to answer, I think it worries me. And my concern is, how are we going to address those issues in order to give the BME community an assurance that we really take this thing seriously? That's yeah. Yeah. Ali? Um, yeah, well, I think Chris, you sort of hit the nail on the head, really, which is we've got a lot of work to do in this area. And, you know, there's going to be no substitute, I think, for going through each each part of it and analysing it properly and understanding what it is we're doing. On Just on the, um, the recruitment part of it, though, uh, we've got some really, really good analysis that John and this media have been doing. Uh, around this, and one of the key key numbers out of it, because there's so there's so much data, is that sometimes you can get lost in it a bit. But I think one of the key numbers for me is that um, one in six of people who apply to seek out for a job are BAME, and uh, if we could replicate that through all of the stages of the uh, application to the appointment process, we would hit our target in a year. You know, do you know so if you see what I mean in terms of one or two years down the path, we could get to the numbers fairly quickly. Um, so what we need to do is examine each stage and see what's happening. So and that, that's what one well, that's what we plan to do. And one of the key parts to start with already we've done is we've already put in place a requirement for diverse panels and uh, interview skills training to make sure that every panel, you know, you think in this day and age that was already a requirement, but actually that's something we've done as a team and we've put in place as an exact team to make sure uh, that all tra panels have uh, uh, the proper training for going into it. For the uh, having the, I, I, I call it the privilege of recruiting staff. I think it's a really important um, responsibility, um, and it's therefore important people are trained properly when they're going to that. Thank you, S Suba. I didn't give you the, didn't come back to you after you had you replied to your questions. Any other points you wanted to raise in response, or are you content with the answer? Okay, thank, thank, thank you, indeed. Um, Michael. Um, yeah. I, I'm going to be hard aged. I agree with what um, Chris um, Subu has said. Um, this is totally unacceptable. I know we're committed. We cannot be in this place. It reflects badly on CCAM. And, you know, I need to say it as bluntly as that. Also, Ali, I'm really grateful for what you've done, but I'm absolutely amazed that we're only now introducing um, a system whereby, um, you know, we have diverse panels on recruitment and we're doing training. I mean, most organisations introduce that. Um, 20 years ago, so we're, we are behind the curve. I'm sorry it's hard language, but I think some we have to say it. The other thing I'd say is um, I'm used to seeing as a member of a board where the organisation is very highly dependent on workforce coming into the organisation. I would like assurance around the recruitment strategy. I've never seen the recruitment strategy. I don't know what it looks like. I don't know how uh, you know welcoming it is. And there's a wealth of experience on this board in the non-executives who could give advice. And it may be through Lawrence Committee, the Workforce Planning Committee, but I think that recruitment strategy needs to be exposed and reviewed, not to be critical, but to help the organisation move forward. And I think that's only one area in which um, the, the people. So um, I just want to echo, we've got to do better than this. And I also would suggest to people I'm also a little bit concerned when we're already using the language that constrains our thinking. So we start by saying, well, the population of the South East is only 14 percent. We're on the hinterland of London. You know, people travel out of London and come around. I think we need to challenge ourselves about putting constraints around our thinking that then mean that we don't move, move forward. I'm not saying it's... I'm, Love to see come to bits. The executive team do a brilliant job, but I think this is where we need to help to move this further forward. Um, David, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. Right. So it's a bit of board. Um, it's a board responsibility for sure. Tom, did you did you want to? Was your hand raised earlier? I think Michael's raised most of my okay. points. So uh, thank, thank you, you. Laurie. No, you're you're on mute, Laurie. Just following on what Michael said, Ali, perhaps what we could do is hold an exceptional meeting within WWC in order to think about the strategy and to draw on the experience of NEDs and other members of the staff just to see if we can uh, move that one ahead quite quickly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any other 
other questions at all. I think we covered all the, the points. Michael, your hand is, is the other oh, hand. Sorry, Chair, no yeah. one. Okay, so, so just in summary, first of all, we'll come on to the rest of the moment. So in the return report, we know there's been some progress, and it's fair to say there has been some movements in, in, in the area of uh, diversity and inclusion, but there is still much to do. We commend the, the work of the staff networks uh, and uh, note your, your comment, Ali, that uh, the contribution they've made in recent in recent times towards uh, the CCAM challenge, but I think the challenge is to the whole board. This is not um, to just, just the executives, it's to all of us. And there's still more to do in CCAM to make this a more, a more uh, diverse and inclusive organisation. And uh, we take that report with uh, um, with enthusiasm and also recognise the challenge we've got ahead of us. So uh, we thank you for that. Can we move on to the actual um, the workforce equality report? Uh, yeah, no, thank you, Chair, uh, and, and thank you for the comments just now as well. Actually, I think it, it just hel it's helpful to reinforce. I think actually where, how much work we've got to do as a trust, but also I think it will be a really positive signal for the trust to actually hear. Uh, the board talking about this in this way as well. I think that'd be very helpful to trust as well. So. Yeah, no, I think I think Michael made a good point regarding the population. Uh, the fact we do, you know, we for the point of view of recruiting our governors, we've extended into South London, for instance. So um, we do a bus onto London. We serve London. May our hospital. We serve London hospitals. Um, I think we do have to bear that in mind in terms of our statistics and proportion of the staff who are from Bain community. So uh, I think uh, let let let's use that as a challenge. Okay, so um, so I just add in a couple of things, and also just to add one point point of factual data as well. The the interview skills training we've actually been we picked up last year as an issue because I was quite surprised when I got here that we didn't insist on that as a, as a mandatory thing, and that's been in place now for nearly a year. So uh, just in case uh, it came across as though we've only just done that, it's been nearly a year now we've been doing that. So just to correct that. So, um, so uh, just a couple of points then, sort of like more to add, because a number of the points have come out in discussion, I think, through through the, uh, the previous uh, papers. Well. It is disappointing, I think, where we are, actually. I think, you know, anyone looking at it would say uh, it, it would be unfair to draw any other conclusion. I think, I learned that, you know, it's disappointing where we are, I think, on where's and at the moment, and we've got quite a lot of work to do in this area. So the, the data is... Uh, uh, um, uh, it makes difficult reading, I think, for the trust, but it also does provide focus as to the kind of things we need we need to concentrate on. So we, we don't need to be despondent about what we need to do is focus on and make sure we work on these areas. So the, the ones I've pulled out, I think, are is uh, um, the likelihood of uh, BME colleagues being appointed to uh, posts compared to white and um, non-disabled colleagues. Um, the higher levels of the same colleagues being taken through the disciplinary and capability processes. I think, Chris, you picked that point earlier as well. And uh, higher levels of uh, perceived or actual bullying and harassment by staff as well who are BAME and colleagues who, are dis who have disabilities. The one thing I, I think I'd pick out of that, because that, that is clearly difficult to hear, I think that the thing I'd pick out of that is that we are seeing improving rates of declaration and reporting. And a bit like the, the freedom to speak up issue, I think a lot of these things, unless people tell you, you, know, you, you cannot get to the, the root cause of what's causing some of these issues. And I'm sure like most of it, actually, as we dive deeper into some of these issues, that education itself will actually be uh, you know, uh, instrumental in, in solving a lot of these problems and improving them. But actually sort of other, other forms of action as well will, will be required, I think, to show that we're really serious about giving improvements in these areas. Um, the uh, the other uh, slight, well, I think sort of it, you know, it's, it's a more positive thing, I think, actually, is we are seeing year on year improvements in access to reasonable adjustments. And I think the Trust set up a specific budget last year so that there, there wouldn't be this local issue where people are struggling how to actually deal with reasonable adjustments at work. And I think that's quite, that's positive. And uh, again, I'd commend the network, the Enable Network, which is the network which champions this area of work for bringing that uh, up and uh, we we raised that and we put some funding in to deal with that point as well. Um, just to pick up one final point then, which is I think just making sure we've covered all the others. Um, in addition to the uh, the numbers and targets we're setting around uh, uh, ethnicity over the next coming years, we've also committed to get to at least equal gender representation in management roles and for that we define that as a gender for change band seven and above. 
So in, in plain language, that sort of uh, role, management role starting at around 40k mark. So what we see as a trust, and this is common across the NHS, um, is that you see very high uh, proportions of female uh, staff represented in the junior grades. And then by the time you start getting into the more middle and senior ranks, uh, that proportion drops off. So uh, similar to the uh, area on um, uh, ethnicity, uh, we've committed to get to at least equal gender representation in management roles uh, as a first step on that. So um, we'll be monitoring our progress against these aims, both the exec level and the workforce, and we'll be committing uh, uh, over time. And uh, I'd commend to the board that actually the board also gets a regular update on these things as well, I'm sure, through the escalation path. And Laurie, as chair of the committee, I'm sure will continue to raise those points. Um, that was all that, that's it, David. Thank you, Ali. Um, any uh, questions or comments on the report? I think we've I think we've made the point in the first first section. Later, this summarises, in fact, provides a quantitative summary of, of of the challenge that we that we face in in CCAM. But also acknowledging some good work that's also gone on. We mustn't lose that. We have done some we have done some good work in in this area, but clearly big challenge which clearly the workforce committee on behalf of the board will will oversee but Laurie we'll have a separate conversation regarding sort of the given importance of this how this is reported in future to the board perhaps on a more regular more regular basis that'd be good okay thank you let's move on to just conclude the meeting if we may um are there any other any other items of urgent business at all um, meeting effectiveness. Well, we are over time, but I hope you agree. It's important subjects that we were discussing: our current performance and accountability to the public, but also our internal workings and how we lead the organisation. I think is again important and on our values. I'll, just to conclude, um, members of the, there are some governors online. Uh, I think represented the public. Are there any items anyone wishes to? Ask a question about relating to the subjects on the agenda today. So, I think Harvey, I saw you see your hand raised. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Keep, keep, um, forgive us if we, we are brief with our answers, but we do need to press on. But we need to give you a chance to have your say. So, Harvey, that's all right. Um, just uh, two questions. I, I've got some other thoughts which I, I might send in to you, but um, the, the questions are in terms of the um, booster and flu vaccinations, is that being immediately offered to CFRs, given that they are an important resource, which is hopefully growing? Um, and we will be offering that, for instance, to the new ones who are just joining. Um, so that's, the, that's one question. The other question, uh, and really it's to say, um, well done to Ali for introducing mandatory training for interviewees. Now, I, I come from a background where we had that more than 40 years ago. And one of the things that I just asked you to um, consider is we had a pass fail for that training, certainly for anybody who was going to do management um, or professional recruitment. Um, and I wonder if that's something that you might consider because just going on a training course doesn't necessarily mean that somebody is trained. Thank you, Preston. Can we take this, Beth, and can we do the yeah. um, access to the vaccine for our uh, volunteer staff? Yeah, absolutely. So the um, booster and the flu are available for all um, contracted CCAM staff, all bank staff, all agency staff, all frontline volunteers, including all CFRs and chaplains, um, all our Churchill and Ryden staff and our air ambulance colleagues and all our students. They are all within our licence. So yes, um, CFRs are permitted to. You just have to have had six months clear since your second vaccine. Yeah. That's one area where TCAM can say we are truly equal. Good. Everyone has been treated the same, which is good. Thank you. And, and uh, Ali, the, the comment regarding the um, question regarding sort of mandatory training and have people reached the right standard or not? Yeah, no, I think it's, it's a very good question. Uh, what we look for is uh, have people actually done the, the training properly? I think have they demonstrated the appropriate level of competence as well as understanding what it is we're, we're seeking them to do? We don't have a pass fail in the way you're suggesting, Harvey, but 
uh, I can I am I'm assured because I've actually looked at all the materials myself around all of the the quality of the materials that we do in the training that we do so um, but um, it's a good point so how do we begin to systemize the recruitment process which I know you're doing and, and with consistent HR inputs into the process which again I know you're developing we can at least begin to form a view on an appropriate interview style and certainly um, it's something we all, we all need to be mindful of and if we don't pass this we're not up to standard we don't get to interview and uh, so I, it's something which I think we do need to think about but I, I just have some practical difficulties there yeah but thank you Philip final word Sorry, tiny point of clarification from something that Bethan just said. Uh, Bethan, um, you said um, six months clear from um, uh, before you can have the vaccination. You, do you mean six months in time, not clear of COVID? Yes, so six months since the date of your second co initial COVID vaccination. If, you, if it's from a positive COVID test, it's 28 days from the date of your positive PCR test. Well, clarification, thank you. But everyone's does that either patient facing staff have the have access to the vaccine when they when they they're six months is six months after their last vaccination. Thank you. Great. I think we've concluded uh, on questions. Uh, Philip, I assume that's an old hand you've got there. So can I thank you all for attending? Um, we thank the public for the Harvey, thank you for your question. We will reconvene. Um, as a, can I suggest we're taking the view from the the company secretary? Would should we aim for two o'clock, Peter? Yeah, oh, so, yeah. What works for me, if it does for others. If um, can colleagues consume a brief lunch in twenty minutes, come back refreshed. Okay, thank you, Nick. We'll see you at two o'clock.